In this video, I will tell about 5 real historical facts that sound like a joke. You won't believe it, but these are historical facts. 1. In the Middle Ages, some conflicts between husband and wife were solved by a court duel. Domestic violence is a serious problem. In the Middle Ages, they found a very original way to solve disputes between spouses, not to forbid them, but to legalize them. Thus, a 1467 book by the duelist Hans Thalhofer called Fechtbutch, Fencing Book, describes the rules for court battles between spouses. The man, sitting waist deep in an earthen pit, was armed with a club. His wife was given a sack with a stone weighing four or five pounds, 1.5 to 2 kilograms. Any techniques were allowed, including blows to the head, strangulation, sticking a baton between a woman's legs, and twisting a man's dick. Yes, Master Thalhofer mentioned such details. The winner was determined by a judge. Two, 60 noblemen of the Holy Roman Empire drowned in feces in Erfurt. One day, two influential gentlemen, Louis III, Landgrave of Thuringia, and Conrad Wittelsbach, Archbishop of Mainz, had a quarrel. There had long been some tension between Thuringia and Mainz, and the Archbishop decided to build a castle on the border with a potential enemy, at Heiligenburg, just in case. The Landgrave declared that this was a provocation and that decent Archbishops do not do this, so now he simply had to organize an invasion of Mainz. Emperor Henry VI, who was just passing through on business he wanted to make war with Poland, nothing special, decided to help the gentlemen make peace. For this purpose he organized the same, that is, an assembly of important persons, in the city of Erfurt. If Louis, Conrad and Henry had met in person, face to face, there would have been nothing to tell. But in the Middle Ages this was not the way things were done, so each showed up to the negotiations with a huge entourage. Plus the nobility from all over the Holy Roman Empire added to the number, some for a serious occasion, some for a banquet. All in all, on July 25, 1184, in St. Peter's Cathedral in Erfurt, more than a hundred people gathered for the negotiations. And as the meeting began, the wooden floor beneath them, not designed for their weight and rotten, collapsed. The Monsignors fell down, broke the next floor with their bodies, and finally collapsed into the huge septic tank beneath the monastery. A septic tank that hadn't been cleaned in years. As a result, more than 60 people died, some from injuries sustained in the fall, others drowned in tons of excrement. Among the dead were such distinguished gentlemen as Gosmer III, Count Ziegenhain, Beringer I. von Meldigen, and Friedrich of Abenberg, and other important persons. As you can see, it's not just in Game of Thrones that the nobles have a hard time. Louis III floundered in the septic tank, but he was pulled out. The Archbishop also survived because he was sitting next to a window. King Henry, meanwhile, was retreating to a niche toilet with a stone floor. In those days, such places and castles were delicately called check rooms. He had to wait, sitting in the latrine, until the servants dragged a ladder and removed him from the second floor of the collapsed building. After that, His Majesty became disillusioned with diplomacy and left Erfurt. 3. Pope Formosa was put on trial after being exhumed. In January 897, Pope Stephen VI decided to accuse his predecessor, Formosus, of heresy. It was the most popular way in Rome to remove an unwanted hierarch to call him a heretic and anathematize him. A sort of abolition culture, only for the popes. The fact is that Formosus anointed the wrong man Arnulf of Carinthia of the Carolingians to the reign of the Holy Roman Empire. After Arnulf, who had briefly impersonated him, was struck down by paralysis, another king, Lambert of Spolet, began to claim the title. Formosa's decision urgently needed to be overturned by the courts, pretending that he was not a pope at all, but a traitor to the church. It did not matter who he anointed. There was, however, one hitch. Formosus had safely died nine months before the trial, so, as expected, he could not come to court. But the fact of the defendant's death did not stop the machinery of justice. They dragged the badly decomposed corpse out of the tomb, dragged it through the streets, brought it to the Lateran Basilica, dressed it in papal robes, and placed it on the throne. 
Pope Stephen accused the corpse of perjury, violation of canon law, and unlawful appropriation of the title of bishop and began his interrogation. The answer, of course, was not Formosus himself, but a deacon hiding behind the back of the throne, who imitated the voice of the deceased. At the end of the session, the corpse was found guilty, all his decisions, including the anointing of Arnulf, were declared null and void, three of his fingers, which he had used for blessings while alive, were cut off, his papal vestment was torn off, and he was buried in the cemetery for the mob. This was not the end of Formosus' adventures. He was exhumed again, apparently by grave diggers who expected to get something to eat. But since the excommunicated Pope was buried without any honors, the robbers found nothing of value, tied a load to the corpse, and threw it into the Tiber River. The dead ex-Pope surfaced, was found by fishermen, and, according to historian Lyotpran Kromonsky, was taken to the Church of the Blessed Prince Peter the Apostle. The, the remains of Formosus are said to have begun to work miraculous healings. In addition, it was recalled that during the Synod of Corpses there was an earthquake that damaged the Lateran Church, which further convinced the mobs of Formosus' sanctity. A little later the new Pope, John IX, reinstated Formosa, buried him in the papal tomb with honors, and forbade any further trial of the dead. And after some time another Pope, Sergius III, reversed this decision and again declared Formosa a heretic, and on the tomb of Stephen VI commanded to leave an inscription saying how good he was for exposing Formosa. It is true that for the third time it was decided not to exhume the poor fellow, and he was left to rest in St. Peter's Basilica. 4. The Galvarino Indians fought the Spaniards with no hands. When the Spanish conquistadors conquered South America, they encountered fierce resistance from the Mapuche, or Arakan, Indians. Nearly 150 Mapuche were captured after a fierce battle at Araucania in 1557. Most of the captives were ordered by the governor of Chile, Garcia Hurtado de Mendoza, to cut off their right hands and noses. And the most ferocious warrior named Galvarino had both hands cut off at once. Apparently, he was really tough in battle. If you think the loss of his limbs stopped Galvarino, you are mistaken. He attached a pair of knives to his stumps and continued to fight the Spaniards. Galvarino even put down a mountain of conquistadors at the Battle of Milarapu without his arms. In the end, though, the Spaniards got the upper hand, slaughtered nearly 3,000 Mapuche and fed Galvarino alive to the dogs. 5. The Romans used urine to wash and brush their teeth. The Romans in general were interesting guys. For example, they were very inventive in their use of urine. Because it contains a lot of ammonia, which has bleaching properties, it was used as a laundry detergent. Specially trained men called fullos worked in the laundries. They immersed the worn togas in vats of settled urine and then trampled them with their feet. Then they washed them in water with ashes or clay. This cleansed the fat from the cloth. Human urine was also used in tanning leather, curing sheep, by pouring urine down their throats, and, according to the Roman historian Columella, used as fertilizer for growing pomegranates. Urine was so essential to the Roman economy that Emperor Vespasian taxed public latrines that sold it. To his son Titus, when asked if his father was crazy, he reasonably replied, money doesn't smell. And for dessert, Here's the most original Roman use of urine. They rinsed their mouths with it to make their teeth whiter. Interestingly, it even made some sense again, thanks to the ammonia. Fortunately, apparently not everyone made such sacrifices, but only the most desperate snobs who valued a snow-white smile. For example, the historian Catullus ironically mentions one such original named Ignatius. If you found the video interesting, don't be lazy to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. It will be the best reward for me. See you in new and even more interesting videos on my channel.